Good afternoon and welcome to today's Link Senior webinar. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. To be eligible for your NAB and NCAP CEU credits today, you must stay on the webinar for the full hour. At the end of the webinar, I will provide the required post-webinar survey evaluation link in the webinar room chat box, and I'll also send it by a constant contact email message following the conclusion of the webinar. Please be sure to fill out that survey no later than midnight this Thursday, January 24th, to be eligible for your CEU credit. If you are not looking for CEU credit today, please do fill out the survey anyway, as we would like to hear your feedback. Link Senior has been providing these informational webinars for more than a year now, and we have had more than 3,000 participants on the line for these events. Uh, this is a look at some of our past speakers and feedback from webinar participants. We are always looking for new ideas for webinar speakers, and if you have an idea, please feel free to email us. Link Senior it currently has more than 300 clients in the United States and Canada, and this is just a snapshot of some of our current partners and supporters. Since September 2017, Link Senior has been working with Responsive Health Management in Toronto on a research study at three long-term care and memory care communities. The study is being funded by Baycrest, uh, the Center for Aging and Brain Health Innovation, and in partnership with Western Oregon University. We're very excited about these preliminary results that show that being highly engaged in recreational activity is also associated with increased cognitive functioning and social engagement. Today, we are excited to have Charles Diegelmorn with us, the CEO and co-founder of Link Senior. Charles will take a minute now to review today's agenda and objectives, and do remember that we will reserve time at the end of this webinar for your questions, which you can post in the chat box in the webinar room. And remember that there is a copy of today's PowerPoint slide deck in the handout section of the webinar room, as well as a PDF of our newly released State of Resident Engagement white paper. Uh, Charles, I will hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Megan. <clears throat> and uh, to all of you on the line, thank you for joining uh, us today. Good morning or good afternoon, or God, you know, depending on where you are. I wanted to start by uh, wishing you a very happy new year. As Megan has said, we've started these uh, <clears throat> webinar more than a year ago and have met incredible success because I think that resident engagement is one of the most successful and most of the one of the most exciting fields today in senior care. Um, but it's also <clears throat> a a big need for more education. We know that a lot of us activity directors, life enrichment coordinators, you know, we are thriving to engage our residents to support their quality of life. And often we need more education and sometimes we um you know we don't have the means to get out of the building to to stay educated and engaged and so this is one of the main reasons and so today <clears throat> what we were excited to present to you is the state of resident engagement in 2019 we wanted to explain a little bit what we saw in the market what research shows us and um, so that was the first section is just to stay you know to provide an outline of how are we doing in engaging our elders or older adults or residents today then we wanted to cover with the second part some of the key challenges that we're seeing right so based on what we're doing why aren't we doing better and why where are the opportunities and we thought they would be really helpful to then go into the third section, which is to say, you know, what are some of the best practices um, today? What are case studies that would help any of us on the line start our work this afternoon after this webinar tomorrow morning with new tools of ideas in optimizing the quality of life of our older adult? But before that, and probably most important, I'd like, and we at Link Senior would like to wish to all of you on the line a very um, uh, celebrate the happy the activity director week and celebrate the work that we all do in resident engagement 
as uh, many of you probably feel on a daily basis, it is a um, under-respected uh, discipline, which has a lot of potential excitement. And most of us on the line, if not all, share one common thing, which is our passion to advance quality of life for older adults. So let's get started. The first part was to lay the ground on what we're seeing for uh, resident engagement again today as we set Tuesday, January 22nd, 2019. And to do this, I think, I think it's important to understand what is the basic, what is resident engagement today and how has it come about and where are we in this journey? One of our favorite quotes is the quote from Abraham Maslow. Some of you might know because he came up with this concept of the pyramid of needs, the hierarchy of needs. A musician must make music, an artist must paint, a poet must write. If he is to be ultimately at peace with himself, what a man can be, he must be. This is a celebration of every and all older adult and resident we serve, understanding that throughout their stay with us, in their home today. Regardless of where the person is physically or cognitively or their interest, they still have the potential to stay someone, right? And that is one of the fundamental aspects of person-centered care. Some of you might know that the, the, the initial concept of person-centered care came from the work of Tom Kitwood. He was a British uh, researcher and doctor actually. And he was very focused on dementia, but beyond that, it was this idea of personhood, right? The idea that regardless of dementia, regardless of why we're, the, the, the resident is with us, there's a positive aspect that can be brought into that person's life. Now, if you look at research, what does research tell us when it comes to engagement? Well, if you take a step back, it's interesting to see that a lot of us, in our population start to age and quote unquote lose this concept, this ability to stay engaged around the age of 50. And a lot of research shows that this is actually a very gradual process. But the interesting aspect is that some of us, actually slightly under 5% of us, tend to not age that way. We, end, we, we tend to stay at a very high function level Right? Sometimes we hit a little bump, like we break a hip, or we lose a loved one, maybe a, uh, a wife or husband. But then we have self-built-in resiliency where we jump back. And we go out through our life, and at the end, we just die you know, very quickly. And I think what is exciting is that every research, even the most recent research, shows that the main differences between people that age this way and this way is only lifestyle, right? Things that can be controlled, that go beyond um, the, the means of, of genetics, the means that we have when we grow up and so on. These are only things that are wellness-based and things that can be changed or helped with, such as social engagement, stay physically active, um, and, and uh, intellectually stimulated and so on. Now, why is this important in what we do? Well, we know that the residents under our care, the people that we work with, are obviously at the latest stages of our life. What this tells us is that as professional, right, as resident engagement, people working in life enrichment position or activity directors, rec therapist, or wellness coordinator, we can dramatically change the experience of aging of our older adults, the people that we serve. Right? That is what is exciting today. I think that historically, we've considered engagement from a very clinical approach, right? so the idea of occupying or providing a stimulus, which is great because these things are measuring, right? and sometimes we don't measure enough in activities. But this lacks something, which is this idea of purpose. What we try to do as activity directors, like, and anyone working in, in the resident engagement field, is to help people throughout their life find purpose. That's a very important word. Now, why is our work so hard? 
right? If if I was to take a position as an activity director, or if anyone started a position, a job today in the activity director world, why is it so difficult? Well, from a market perspective, if we look at the market itself, we know that sadly we're not staffing much, right? We were on the phone actually even this morning with a provider that acknowledged the fact that in some of their locations, they only had one staff person for over 100 person, over 100 residents. We also know because of the age and other, other reasons that this population that we serve cannot self-recreate. And sadly, because the family isn't visiting, then it falls back onto our staff to engage the, the resident. So it's, it's very difficult and some would argue sometimes almost impossible, especially if we consider the fact that we are still providing a lot of medication, antipsychotics, antidepressants, which often get in the way of us engaging our resident in a meaningful and purposeful way. What is the result of all of that? The result of this is actually a sad and scary statistic uh, from the CDC, which is, you know, how much, how many minutes of activities does a resident receive each day? So this CDC report shows that in the skilled world, the long-term care world, it is 11 minutes of activities per day. It is slightly better in assisted living because in assisted living, we tend to staff more, but still even 20 minutes isn't enough in the, in the idea that regardless of these 20 minutes, one, people would just sit there because they can't self-recreate. And I think the second aspect and a big opportunity for what we do is the fact that, you know, one would ask the question, what is being done in these, um, in these minutes? Um, often we don't know. There's the old and sad joke in activities, which is this concept of three Bs, right? Bingo and Bible and birthdays. So beyond this incredible opportunity that we can try to provide more activities, one of the exciting aspects today in resident engagement is us providing actually more than the three Bs, right? More in terms of quality, but also more in terms of quality, right? So in a nutshell, this is the background on resident engagement and patient-centered care, why it is that our job is difficult, and what is the current experience of our residents today in senior care. What are the key challenges for this? Why is it <clears throat> that we're not providing more in terms of quantity, nor in terms of quality? Um, one would argue that the first reason is that there isn't enough evidence behind um, engagement, right? If you look at a uh, recent meta-study of everything related to non pharmacological intervention, resident engagement, how much evidence is there behind the fact that this can actually increase quality of life in a measurable way, clinical outcomes, and so on and so on? So this, the meta study actually showed that um, there is some level of evidence, but not enough, right? Not enough. So what's interesting with this study is that <clears throat> it also shows beyond the fact that we want to do more of that type of research. Uh, it also shows the things that are the most that have the most backing. So we can see here that music is actually the one that has the most research behind it, aromatherapy, but also things like uh, therapeutic touch and massage, and this concept here at the bottom of tailored activity, which is exciting. But I think that you know beyond the fact that there isn't enough research, it shows that something that we all believe everyone on the line should believe because we are in this industry which is engaging the older adult. But I think that one of the one of the key challenges is we need more research. We need more correlation between what I do as an activity director and the quality of life of the older adult. This is the main one of the main challenges. Um, and there's still a lot to be done, uh, which is exciting. The other aspect um, the second part that we wanted to share, and this is very, um, this is an exclusive survey that we did at Link Senior, where we 
in 2018 interviewed more than 300 resident engagement professional in the US and Canada. So these are people throughout different levels of care, throughout different types of position, whether they were rec therapist, life enrichment directors or activity directors. And <clears throat> the result of that was pretty interesting. We asked a simple question, which is, what do you prefer about your job? And so I'll leave you a few seconds to read on the slide, but across level of care, what is interesting is one thing that we love to do is to get to know the resident. We love this interaction with the residents to understand who each individual is, what they need, what they like, and what we should be doing to engage them, right? So in blue, we can see that we very much enjoy spending time with the residents, getting to know them. The second part that we really enjoy doing is planning program for them, right? And then leading program. So it's interesting to see that the blue and the green are mostly interaction with the resident, which is getting to know them and then leading programs with them. One thing that is interesting is not many of us actually like documentation, which is necessary, but not many of us like it, right? So one would, one would, one would uh, draw as a conclusion here that a lot of us professionals love to be in contact with our residents and learning and sharing with them and actually creating and engaging them. But what is the biggest obstacle? Well, we kind of know that. We, one of the biggest obstacle is the fact that our, um, you know, if you think about engaging our resident, if you consider the blue part is really, sorry, is really the fact that if it is the cognitive impairment of our resident, right? The other obstacle that we see, and this is very much in tune with the biggest trend in our industry today is related to staffing. You know, we have a high turnover and we just lack staff. Right. And the third part is um, what do we find the most challenging? And I think this is one of the most interesting slides and data point of our findings of this survey is that regardless of the level of care in which we work, documentation, which is basically uh, care plan, notes, um, tracking attendance and all of that, the administrative part of our work is what is the most challenging to us. And that is probably because there aren't enough processes or workflows or tools to help us get there. But this is the one that we feel as a field, as a discipline, that if it was easier, we could do better. And that is what is important, right? What is preventing us to get to do something better? If you consider what we try to do as professional in resident engagement, that is relatively simple, right? What we want to know is, one, we want to get to know the resident. We want to plan something for them. We want to engage them. And we want to evaluate them, evaluate our program. This is what every, every person on the line and in the field of resident engagement tries to do every day, right? For some of you, you might realize that this is API, um, assess, plan, implement, and evaluate. It's one of the key concepts in rec therapy and activities. It's very similar to the care planning process. We see this across uh, nursing and different uh, disciplines. But the idea and one of the main opportunity in our work today is that we're not very good at this in the sense that we sometimes would do all of these tasks, but they are often paper driven and there is no uh, tools out there to help us do all of this in a coordinating way, coordinated way. And I think that that is one of the biggest opportunities, really seeing and understanding where are we in achieving these for all of our residents? Because we know from research and our education that this is how we not only meet the needs of our residents, but we also support their purpose. At Link Senior, we are passionate about this idea of quote-unquote prescribing resident engagement, right? Sometimes we use the word prescribe and people have different types of reaction, but given the healthcare aspect of our industry, 
prescribe has a lot of meaning where you know we should think about engagement as the first modality for our experience, for the experience of our residents, right? We still are in an industry where we're providing too much medication such as antipsychotics, antidepressants, and engagement such as music for music therapy, reminiscing, or social engagement should be the first thing we consider for all of our residents. I would just make one last comment on this is that if you look at most other industries that you can interact with, all of your experience is highly customized on who you are, right? Your Amazon.com account, when you log into it, is very different than mine. The way we are, all of us are greeted in different, quote unquote, customer experience. Today, most of it is personalized. And still, when you consider the resident that we serve, that we engage, a lot of our work still isn't personalized enough. And I think this is one of the most exciting things today in 2019 of our work, is really how do we consider engaging, creating, and actually providing an experience that is person-centered for each resident. So again, exciting things. The third part, and this is really what we were hoping to provide with you with best practices and case studies, the third part is a um, summary of some of fundamental best practices and what we've seen people do uh, do well or try to optimize. <clears throat> I think the first part of key concept that some of you might be familiar with, you know, the work of um, Maslow helped us understand that the needs of the people we serve, in our case, the older adult, have different sets of priority. This helps us understand that until we can say that we are helping all of our residents self-actualization, in terms of self-actualization, there is more work to do. If you look at um, one of the past webinars we did with the validation method, Vicky de Claude Rubin, what was interesting is Naomi Fell took this concept, but also took other concepts like Eric Erickson, and helping understand how we can, one, understand what is the unmet, un met need, need of our residents, but also how can we address it? One of the other key concepts is this concept of wellness, right? So this is something beyond senior care, beyond the idea of aging, across our human experience, we should be considered as a, in a holistic fashion, right? Wellness goes beyond just disease or infirmity absence. But the idea that we all need something, you know, coming back to um, Tom Kitwood and Abraham Maslow's quote initially, we are defined by a lot of different things. And remember, I told you about this old concept of three Bs and activities. We should all be thinking about this holistic approach to residents, right? Bingo, Bible, birthday are great in it by itself, but we want much more. We are defined by much more um, if we were to be considered in a person-centered way. So these are key concepts. You know, one of the other aspects, and some of you, uh, this might resonate, some of you might a little bit less, but we know as an industry, there's been a lot of changes in terms of regulation. So obviously, <clears throat> um, you know, it, it's, it's always an ongoing work. A lot of us might consider regulation as a challenge in their work. But I think what's exciting about the new rules of participation is for the first time ever, the rules, the, the regulation, the core of the regulation, the fabric of the regulation have taken concepts such as person-centered care, right? And so, you know, some people might think, well, documentation, these regulations are, um, are not helping me, it's just adding work, <clears throat> you know? I think it's interesting to consider the fact that sometimes um, regulations are a little bit like brakes in, in the cars that we drive, right? I would ask you a question, a, uh, a simple question is, why do we have brakes in a car, right? Well, some of you might think why well, it's to brake and slow down, but that is not the main reason. The reason why we have brakes in a car is actually to drive faster and safer, right? 
And I think it's important to understand that in some cases, and hopefully most cases, regulations help us a little bit like breaks. They help us to do more, better, and provide us a framework in which to operate on. Now, some of you in the line on the line work in the assisted living um, segment, and <clears throat> I just want to share with you that we have been seeing more and more uh, questions around regulation for assisted living. So obviously the regulatory burden is not the same in assisted living, but in the state of New York and in the state of Illinois in the past few weeks, we've had partners of ours say that surveyors looking at the licensure was actually asking questions about dementia care activities and what had been done for each resident, right? So these are concepts obviously very strong in the skilled nursing world. But don't forget that there is some level of regulations in assisted living. And actually, some people say that there's a more, that there is going to be more and more regulations there. So who knows? But these are still uh, important concepts. Now, <clears throat> we talked about modality a few minutes ago. We wanted to share one of the key um, document, document and educational tool that at Linksino we provided. And it's important to frame these a little bit. Some of you might be familiar with the word or the work of Dr. Alan Powers. He wrote a defining book in our industry called Dementia Beyond Drugs. And without going into too much details, Dr. Alan Powers was one of the he, one of the key Eden alternative um, researchers and participant. But the whole concept and a lot of his work was to consider engagement again as the first modality. And to help you, we at Link Senior have created what we call dementia cue cards, which is to look at research, look at best practices out there, and depending on the type of quote unquote behavior or behavior expression that some of our residents, especially the ones living with dementia, or cognitive impairment can be showing, what can be done, right? And so three examples here, I think there are more than 40 different cue cards that we've created. Um, but the way these work are simple, where we have identified a quote unquote behavior, we help you identify what type of behavior it is, just to make sure that we're seeing the correct one, and what can be done. And these, again, are evidence-based, and so we've looked at research to understand, for example, if a resident is crying out, if the resident is pacing, if the resident is expressing some kind of aggressive behavior, what are the best practices that we can do to help the residents through these expressions? Some of our clients and partners use these as a way to, one, educate the team on what can be done. It also is a way to educate other of our care partners, so for example, people involved in nursing or our volunteers, or sometimes the family in terms of what can be done for each resident. And so we invite you, if you haven't accessed these, um, feel free to send us an email. I think we still send them in our uh, monthly newsletters, but these are accessible at no cost to anyone, regardless of whether you are a partner of ours or not. And again, this is a way for us to show and actually help people engage their residents and improve and um, kind of have the field advance and, and so on and so on. But I think that one of the key elements, you know, beyond thinking about modality and this very clinical aspect, one of the things that we're very excited to show you is an analysis of more than 400 discussion we had throughout 2018 with people like you working in the field of engagement. And here they are. What we've worked is, in a way, trying to understand what are the key resident engagement questions. So for example, if anyone was to start as an activity director or a life enrichment coordinator, how should we consider our work, right? What are the three questions we want to continuously ask ourselves to make sure that we're doing well, we're doing better, and we're trying to always improve, right? This idea of quality performance improvement is important. The first question 
all of us should be able to answer, or if not, try to work on this, is are we engaging everyone, right? This is fundamental. In the skilled world, it's a quote-unquote compliance uh, question. In assisted living and senior living, that's a question that every family member wants to know. Are we engaging everyone? Right? And we, as professionals trying to do better, we want to make sure that we're doing that. The second question, <clears throat> once we know that we've been engaging everyone, is are we engaging every resident under our care based on their needs and preferences? Right. This is the mere concept of person-centered care, and this is how we know that we're doing a good job. We are engaging our older adults, our elders and residents, based on who they are and what they like. And the third ask, the third question is, are we thinking about well-being and outcomes, right? Are we optimizing wellness and well-being for our residents? And are we doing it in a way where we can, quote, unquote, measure? That's important. So we love these questions in the sense that it helps us help partners and people in the field really understand, one, where they are, two, what are the challenges that they're experiencing? And three, <clears throat> how can they how they can improve? Now, the other best practice is obviously technology. Now, as you know, we at Link Senior do build technology to help professional advance their work. I think that one thing that's very important to us is not technology for the sense of technology, but technology in order for us to improve resident engagement. So in full disclosure, I'm about to show a couple of slides on Link Senior, but I want us and everyone on the, in the, uh, on the line to really consider just technology itself as a way to advance our work. There are many of us technology vendors in the industry, and I would recommend that some of you, if interested, look into them. Again, Link Senior being one of many. We, in 2019, are in a position where technology can help us with almost all of our work, right? We should not be using paper in our daily work today, right? If we still are, some of us are still are doing that. And if you look at the activities, it is one of the most paper-heavy department in senior care which is again a big opportunity because we know that once we digitize it, right, then there's a lot of opportunities to drive better. But one of the biggest opportunity is this idea of measuring, which is one of the key concepts in activities to help us do better, right? There's this famous quote that says that when you measure, you can manage. And once we manage, then we can draw more respect on our position and field and we can optimize engagement for all of our older adults of residents. <clears throat> we at Link Senior obviously help people do that. And one of the interesting aspects is some of the discussions we've been having recently where not only do we know how much our partners are engaging their residents, right? It depends a lot on the different level of care. But what is also exciting is also to see how that teams are spending time, right? So the idea is that in real time, one can see, you know, is our staff spending a lot of time doing one-on-ones versus groups activities, right? So from assisted living and memory care, we see obviously that we are doing many more one-on-one -on -one in memory care, which is normal, right? People need us more. And <clears throat> we know from research that people living with dementia cannot withstand large group activities. But one would beg the question here, like in skilled nursing, why is there so few one-on-one? -on -one? And there are many different reasons. One is the fact that in this data, we also use the data used for short-term residents. But there's also an aspect that in the skilled world, there's a high staff turnover and not many need, not many um, uh, staff member, which is a big opportunity, right? And again, it's we we should be doing more, but that is an opportunity for us to do um, to do better if we were measuring to show the quality of our work. One of the other aspects is also how well are we doing, right? If we are to measure what we do, 
we inherently want to make sure that residents are active in our programs. And so using this kind of data helps us understand, well, one, are we doing a good job? Two, how much is activities contributing to things like satisfaction, for example, right? Or customer service or person-centered care, right? The higher the blue, the better. But if we had this measure, it would also help us in some of our interdisciplinary team uh, meetings where we as a team want to increase the quality of our work. Like for example, QAPI would look at the active number here and see that as important as a group, but also for every and all residents. <clears throat> so these are really exciting data points that once we start measuring, we can optimize and show the quality of our work. And this is why at Link Senior, we really think that 2019 is an exciting uh, year because all of that data really helps us transform our work, our field, and also the experience of our residents. I do want to mention that today we released a lot of this data in a white paper that is available on our website. I think it's also available in the uh, webinar room where you can download this presentation and also have access to key data points. And the idea is really to one, provide an overview of where we are today in this industry, and two, understand what are the, some of the key challenges and how we can improve, right? People really are considering today our work activities as a way to drive better business, right? Beyond just quality of life and clinical outcomes, better business. We at Link Senior, throughout the years, have had evidence of this. I want to point out a major work from one of our partner, Kendall and Hudson. Uh, it's one of the affiliate of Kendall Senior Living in New York, where a few years ago they embarked in a journey of untying the elderly from a uh, drug aspect, from some of the medication. Uh, untying, untying the elderly is key to Kendall's philosophy, and they were very interested in reducing the use of antipsychotics to zero. I'm not going to say at all that Link Senior did it for them, but we were one of the modalities, one of the work, one of the tools that they used to get there and stay there. This is possible. And it actually is evidence by one of our research study that Megan mentioned very early in our presentation today, where Link Senior today can say that it is evidence-based in the sense that research has shown that we can not only increase social engagement, reduce things like cognitive dysfunction, behaviors, and the use of medication, but also really do it at the resident level. Again, this is exciting for Link Senior, but I would argue that it's even more exciting for the industry itself, but it, because it really shows that our work in resident engagement can really trigger the outcomes, whether they are clinical, quality of life, or also financial outcomes of our work, of our industry. There's a lot more of the data, and we are still measuring it. But I did want to share something, which is about engagement as a whole, where this research identified and actually worked, um, identified the differences between people that are highly engaged and uh, not so highly engaged, basically low engagement and high engagement. Again, in the field of engagement today, in the field of activities, we sometimes don't know how effective we can be. And I can tell you that you can be extremely effective. We've shown through this study that engaging people based on who they are, what their needs and preferences, antipsychotic use can be reduced by 20%. This is huge. We also know that behaviors, aggressive behaviors, can be reduced by 18%. We can increase Social engagement by 20%, this is, this is really, really um, important. And the last one, you would think, you know, if you compare the other quote-unquote numbers to the other one, that three isn't big. But in, an increase in 3% in, in cognitive functioning is a huge result as well. Let me give you a little bit of context. <clears throat> Most research in cognitive functioning in senior care have shown a stabilizing 
right? Always remember that the older adult that we serve, just because of aging, is going to decrease in terms of cognitive functioning, right? Most research today have shown that properly engaging people could stabilize that or sometimes increase by 1%. So an increase of 3% actually is major, obviously, for uh, us at Link Senior, but also for the field of engagement because it shows that we can do 3% or probably even more, which is exciting. The last aspect that we wanted to share with you is some exciting work about the future of engagement. And, you know, we're always reminded that we want to meet the needs of our residents. But it's important to say that people in this industry, in research, are actually trying to measure that, trying to measure how well are we engaging people based on who they are. And one would argue if there's a, few, if there's a measure of our work, um, that would be that in the future, right? How good are we in measuring, in engaging people based on who they are? This is the work from Dr. Kim von Heitzma and Katie Abbott. They are the people behind their work around the PELI, the preference of everyday living instrument. And um, this is very exciting because it shows that not only if we measure, we can optimize, but we can really drive our, uh, our, our industry better and provide meaningful engagement to our residents. The last aspect is um, uh, fun and interesting is a project that Link Senior started actually a year and a half ago, which is about anti-ageism. Some of you might be aware of this campaign called All People Are Cool. And this is a stance, a platform that we designed to help us really kind of show the core cool work that we do. Um, you know, one of the most limiting factor in our work is the fact that aging isn't quote unquote sexy, right? But it actually is. It is, we're passionate about aging. We're passionate about the fact that old people are cool. You could argue that everyone is cool, but I think there's a lot to be said about how do we fight anti-ageism. And any of you are welcome to participate in that discussion by going to oldpeoplear.co, participating in the discussion, and also sharing some of your um, experiences and stories. With that, I would love to leave it up to questions and we actually have a little bit of time to do q and A's. So Charles, the first question is, uh, how do you believe we can elevate the role of activity directors today? Um, there's been some talk about your idea of a chief engagement officer. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> right, so I think one of the key challenges in resident engagement is the mere fact that this discipline uh, this position doesn't have enough respect. Uh, you know, if I'm an activity director and I go to my boss and I say, please double my budget, uh, the answer is just going to be no. Um, and, and the main reason for this no, beside the fact that money isn't free, is the fact that it's very difficult for me to show the impact that I have. And I think that for me to get to the, into these discussions, to this table, I need to start measuring one of the biggest piece of advice that we would have for anyone in this position is to start measuring to show that work. But I think that from an organization standpoint, and at Link Senior, we've actually written different blogs and different articles on that, we see engagement activity directors as the most um, underserved, on, on, I mean, respected the least, but also where there's the biggest opportunities to invest in. So we actually wrote a couple pieces where we believe that every organization should have a new CEO. And I'm not saying replacing their CEO, but a chief engagement officer, right? We should have a way where somebody at the C level is really interested in furthering engagement. And it doesn't mean necessarily promoting someone to that quote unquote C-suite level, but it's at least having someone who bears the responsibility and actually understand and drives better engagement. And until organizations really consider and understand the untapped opportunity in activities, I think there's still a lot of work to be done. Thank you. 
another question is, how would you use technology programs to enhance person-centered care in end-of-life care? Um, <clears throat> I think I would start back to what are we trying to do as a staff member, right? This idea of, um, well, it's one of the key concepts in rec therapy, but also activities. Regardless of where the person is throughout their life, we want to, one, understand who they are, um, to understand what kind of programming we should be doing for them, what type of engagement, and uh, and do them and evaluate them. So let me be very specific. <clears throat> In the research associated to end of life, we know that different types of mod modalities work better, right? So for example, from a research standpoint, we know that hand massage, uh, music for music therapy, these worked significantly well. But again, they are effective one, once we know who the resident is and what type of engagement is needed. How can we impress upon staff that interruptions last longer than the few moments they are interacting with the resident during an activity? What do you mean by that? So I think this speaks to how can we be more purposeful throughout our days and making sure that engagement is yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I think um yeah, that, that's a question that I love because it's one of the key I mean that's one of the easiest way to improve engagement, right? And I think it means it's it's to the fact that activity directors should see themselves as the champion of engagement. And in doing so should uh, be constantly educating every team member, every care partner in engaging the older adult that we serve. Anyone that um, interacts with an older adult, a resident, has an opportunity to ed to engage them in a person-centered way. And the way I, I would look at this question as most people that work in senior care work in senior care because they have a passion for the older adult. Most of them are, are very well-intentioned, and sometimes the bottleneck is just education. So I think I would consider just two things is um, educate people on the fact that every interaction is an opportunity, and as much as possible, sharing information. And I think this is one of the opportunities for technologies or workflows is helping every care partners understand who each resident is. Uh, so because recreation departments are so understaffed currently, do you have any recommendations on how to maximize our time to maximize pers pers purposeful engagement with each of our residents? Yeah, I mean, I think, <clears throat> I think the first part is um, coming back to one of the key points that we've been seeing is um, we got to show our work, right? I mean, I can do fantastic work from nine to five, and then Megan can come in at 5.15 and work till nine. If we don't work as a team, um, you know, it's, it's just gonna be almost impossible. And, and one of the key aspects of us working as a team is measuring our work, right? Capturing what we do, sharing it, collaborating. Once we do that, then we can, you know, get into the idea of interdisciplinary work. I think that one of the what the person is asking is is something that we see in the industry throughout, which is the the lack of staffing, the high staff turnover. But one of the fundamental issues still is that the industry is using much too much paper. If we were to use slightly less paper, we would be able to share our work, work as teams and then promote our work and show its importance. And finally, what types of technology specifically are you talking about that would benefit the activity director in order to make their job easier? Um, again, you know, at Link Senior, we do, we do work, I think, that, that I believe is exceptional, but I would consider um, different types of, I would consider not technology for technology, and I would consider, I would analyze what am I doing day in, day out? What do I like doing? What I what I dislike doing? What What is the work that I'm just not good at as a team, right? And then I would go out and spend quality time understanding what is the technology landscape today? 
and really kind of ask, um, you know, what can be done um, with with these different tools. And I think that one of the things that I love with the world of activities is the fact that it's a very collaborative um, uh, field. Most activity directors have a peer network where they share information amongst themselves. So to this person's question, I would ask around, you know, what are things that work? Uh, why does it work? Would it work for me? And so on and so forth. Um, but I would say that technology, again, is a mere to, is a way for me to advance uh, what I do, not just the solution by itself. Thanks, Charles. Uh, so now we wanted to share the upcoming webinars that we have scheduled for 2019. Uh, we'd like everyone to save the date for our next webinar, which is February 12th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. This is going to feature Katie Abbott and Kimberly Van Heitzma, who will speak about the top 10 preferences supporting resident purpose in senior care. Just a note that we are only able to offer NCAP credits next month. There will be no NAB credits next month. Um, so please save the date. Um, these registrations will be available on our website. Um, a recording of today's webinar will also be available. Uh, right now, I am going to put in the chat box a link to the required survey for CEU credit. If you're looking for NAB or NCAP credit for today's webinar, please fill out the survey in the chat box. I will also be sending that by email following the webinar. Um, that will come through constant contact, so please check your spam boxes just in case it lands there. You'll have until midnight on Thursday the 24th to fill that out, and we will send the certificates to everyone Friday. That would be Friday this week. Uh, and a reminder that the handouts today are in the handout section of the webinar room. Those include the slide deck uh, as a PDF document, as well as the 2019 State of Resident Engagement white paper that Charles referenced. Um, and for any questions, I will be sending my contact information in the constant contact email that will go out shortly. Uh, so we thank you for your time, and we hope to see you on February 12th next month. Thank you so much. Thanks, Megan. Take care, everyone. Have a good afternoon.